So I hate it when I'm retelling a story and I'm telling the story, I'm running through it, and then there's one little itty bitty detail that I can't remember. It goes something like, oh man, I was at this event, it was amazing, we were having a great time, and then, oh, the song came on, it's my favorite song. The name of the song was, uh, the name of the, oh, what was the name of the, God. John, remember we were at the event, what was the name of that song that, you don't know either, of course not. Um, and then you obsess about it. Has anyone ever had this experience? Where it's like, I know that it's there, it's on the tip of my tongue, I just can't get it out. So what do you do? You start thinking about it. You start going through old playlists. You walk up to people you don't know. You start humming the tune. Have you heard this song? Well, who sings it? It's like you get obsessed with it. And then eventually, either two things typically happen. The first thing is that through this obsessive process, you figure out the answer. You find an old playlist. The song comes on the radio. You figure it out. Or have you ever had this experience? Maybe it's days later and you're going for a jog, or you're walking in the middle of the street, and out of nowhere, the thought flies into your head. And you go, ah, that's what the thought is, and it's an amazing experience. You start high-fiving strangers, chest-bumping pedestrians. It's an amazing time. In that experience, in that shared life experience that so many of us have had, is actually a formula. There's elements and components that are within it that if we can reach into it and pull it out, we can systematically provide more innovation in the things that we do. So what I'm gonna do with you is share with you how to do exactly that with our time here together. Now, the important thing to think about before we go into what innovation can mean to us is understanding what is innovation. And at its core, you know, and the truth is, I don't think everybody should be innovative. I think that's a task that is too much responsibility for most people. So a lot of people don't want that responsibility. They say, no, that's for Elon Musk to do. That's for the wild and crazy young entrepreneurs of impact and the extreme entrepreneurship tour. They should do stuff like that. I'm just going to sit here and receive the benefits of it. But I believe everyone should be tasked with the idea of thinking innovatively. Thinking innovatively can be applied to every single thing that we do. And the more innovative that we think, the more innovation comes from it. But most importantly, what I think we should really be focusing on is the idea of problem solving. Sometimes being innovative sounds like a big, scary dragon that needs to be slayed, like our organization needs to be innovative. And it's like, well, how do we do it? I don't know, but we should do it. But instead, maybe what we should focus on is problem solving. I believe that if we care genuinely about solving problems, then innovation sparks itself. My belief is that innovation is the byproduct of problem solving. The more we can tune our thinking to problem solving, the more innovative thinking we will do, and the more innovative we will become, and the better off everybody in humanity will be. So let's go through the system. What are the mechanisms? There's three main things in that musical experience that I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, the first one, I'll illustrate through an example of my son. Um, this is my son, Asher, right here. He's a, a couple months old in this picture. Um, and if there's any parents, uh, you probably know feeding or teaching a child, more importantly, self-feeding, is one of the messiest processes in the world. He gets food all over him. I get food all over me. We go through a load of laundry every single time we feed him. So the problem was I hated the fact that he would get so messy. So I kept asking myself, there has to be a better way to feed a child. I didn't know what it was. I would go to some of the older people that I knew who had children, who raised a bunch of kids, and said, how do you feed them so the food doesn't get all over their face? And it was like, well, it's just a messy process. You just have to deal with it until they get older. And you know, some people have kids who never actually learn how to put the food in their face, more is on the face than in the belly. So I kept asking myself, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. And then one day, I'm walking through the grocery store, going to pick up the baby food, and usually it's the baby food that's in the jar, that we've all seen a thousand times, and all of a sudden, something jumped out at me. It's always been there, I just never paid attention to it. And what it was, was this pouch right here. Now, this is a fairly new innovation in baby food. Basically, instead of putting the food into a pouch, they open it up, it's in a little squeezy pouch, uh, excuse me, instead of putting it in a jar, it's in a squeezy pouch, they eat it mess-free. So this is my son, a little bit older, a little bit cleaner, and his parents a little bit wiser. I believed, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there had to be a way. So by focusing on that, it's a very important step to the first part of what innovative thinking really is. It's having a positive belief that there is a solution. If we think back to the musical situation, you know that you know the name of the song. There is no doubt in your mind that the name of the song and the singer is in your head. All you have to do is figure it out. 
My belief is every single problem has a solution. Every single question has an answer. You just either need to remember it or you have to figure it out. There's actually a really great um, ancient teaching, which is fantastic if you try it. The way that you can figure out challenges and solve problems right now is to go into your future self and remember what the right solution was. It's kind of a crazy idea, but it's really powerful. But if you believe that there's an answer, there will be one. All of a sudden, something will pop out at you that you've never noticed before. And there's studies to prove why this is so powerful. At Drexel University and Northwestern University, some professors got together and did a study. They wanted to test how innovative people thought. So there were a set of series of innovation questions that people had to solve that would spark an aha moment for them to have the solution. They did brain scans and found out that there was a strong correlation between the individuals who had high innovation and aha moments and people who had a positive mood before they started the experiment. What that means is that what we first have to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt is there is an answer. There is a possibility. I may not know it right now. I may not remember it. I may not have found it out, but it exists. That's the first step in it. The second step is making sure that we understand that the questions we ask have to be the right questions. I believe that asking questions is the answer. One of the best ways to do that is take a definitive statement that is culturally a norm, that is accepted, and turn that into a question. A simple one is, babies can't feed themselves. Turn that into, how do babies feed themselves? There were a lot of norms that we took for granted before. There were certain things that we said in our culture, this just can't happen, we just can't fly. And obviously the Wright brothers did a real good job in making sure that we were able to. Take anything that seems to be a definitive statement accepted in your society, in your culture, in your personal life, in your industry, and turn that into a question. The right questions are the answer. And when we start focusing on the right questions, it brings us to focus. Focus is crucially important. When you think about that song, you can't think about anything else except getting the name of that song. What's the name of the guy? Who sung it? What, what is his name? It's all you focus on. Now, as you can see on this big focus where there's a big red focus, everyone probably saw that very easily. But maybe some of us didn't notice that there was also a little word focus in the corner. Now, I asked you to look at the word focus. Which one did you choose to see? Well, most likely you look at the big red one. Why? Because it gets our attention. It's bright, it's colorful, it's what we're focused on. Both of those elements were there for you to look at. And even though I've pointed out to you this little focus, you're probably still fl flicking your eyes back to the big one. That's where our focus is because what we focus on the most, what we see the most, is what we start experiencing the most. Here's a great example. Uh, a friend of mine, his name is Brett King. He's an amazing photographer out in Michigan. And he said that our mind is just like when we take a photo. If I were to show you this photo right here and ask you, what do you think is the focal point of this photo? I mean, we've got the skyline, we've got cars, we've got buildings, houses, trees, but I think it's pretty safe to say that all of us would agree that this building is the focal point. That's what we look at, everything seems to bring our attention here. Why is that? Well, the other elements of the photo are a little out of focus, they're a little blurred. For example, if I asked you to tell me as many details as you could about this building that's circled, you could probably come up with a lot of ideas. If I asked you to tell me all the details about this building in the corner, it'd be a little bit more difficult. It's in the picture, it's in your life, you're surrounded by it, but that's not where your attention is. You know, the um, example of this that I think we can all relate to is if anyone here has ever gotten a new car, as soon as you get the new car, all of a sudden everybody and their mama is driving that car on the road. The cars have always been there, but because it's in your focal point, now you pay attention to it. And what's cool about this is that there's science behind this. There's actually a part of our brain called the reticular activating system, or RAS. What this does, it filters out all of the things that are happening so that we can focus on what our mind deems as most important. Now, what they postulate is that right now, there are two million bits of data flying into your brain. So what that means is that there's no possible way you can focus on two million things at once. I mean, I'm a married man, my wife says I can't focus on one conversation at once, so I need to be more focused in those things. No way I could do two million. So I'll give you an example. If I told you to pay attention to this TEDx LIU sign right here, you might notice how beautiful it is. This is extremely well done. It's handcrafted by an amazing person here at the university. And if I ask you to focus on all of the detail on it, as I did this, you probably have forgotten what it feels like to have the seat supporting you. Well, maybe now that I said that, your attention was brought to how the seat feels underneath you. It's always been there. It's constantly there. But what we focus on 
is what dictates the quality of our life. Tony Robbins has an amazing quote. I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. He says that the quality of your life is in direct, in direct proportion to the quality of the questions you ask yourself. The majority of us ask extremely bad questions. We say things like, why does this always happen to me? Why do I always have to be paired up with the person that doesn't want to work hard? Why is this such a bad industry for me to be in? Why can't I ever make money? These are not good quality questions. If we focus on the idea that there is a possibility, and we put our focus on what we want to solve, we have to ask good quality questions. Now, what I've been able to do in my own way is codify what's been done by millions of innovators before me and what will be done by innovators in the future and put it into a simple question. The question I'm about to share with you, you can use in any situation. You can use it for how to get home faster. You can use it for ways to create a business. You can use it for the littlest things and the biggest world problems. All you have to do is plug and play. So that question is, I'm pausing for dramatic effect. Boom! Here it is, very simple. How can I desired outcome even though current challenge? How can I desired outcome, even though current challenge? Now, the reason why this question is so powerful is because it gets your mind thinking that there must be an answer. An example of this might be, how can I start a business even though I don't have any money? What most people say is, I can't start a business because I don't have money. What you need to start doing is take definitive statements and turn them into questions. How can I separate myself in the job market right now, even though competition is at its highest? Elon Musk probably asked himself, how can I create a sexy, environmentally friendly car that people actually want to buy, even though everything in the market is counterintuitive to that belief? People at Charity Water asked, how can I get clean drinking water to the 800 million people around the world who need it, even though they may not have the resources to do it right now? I have a great friend, he's an amazingly talented gentleman, he's an author, he's called The Mentor Guy, and his name is Bert Trevaeus. He told me about a trip that he took to India. When he was in India, he said that he was in the middle of this rural area, and there was a computer pod. And he's like, I don't understand, there's no outlets, there's no electricity, how are these computers running? So they easily could have said, there's no way, we don't have electricity. How can we have computers if we don't have electricity? But they asked themselves, I bet, how can we have this computer lab even though we don't have electricity? What they did is they set up a motorcycle outside that was connected to a generator. They put gas in the uh, engine, turned the motor on, and had the motorcycle running, which was connected to a generator that was pumping electricity into this rural remote area. There is always an answer. You have to truly believe in your heart of hearts that there is always an answer. Now, this is important. When you ask a question, I say it's akin to giving someone a high five, okay? If anyone here has ever given someone a high five, try it, by the way, if you don't believe me, try it. Go to give someone a high five. It's a social norm. You have to get a high five back. It's impossible to leave someone hanging. It's a, it's a social faux pas. So what you do when you ask a question is you put your hand up and you're waiting for the response. Now, most people will either give you a high five or they'll sit there reluctantly and you just go, eh, 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 and they go, okay, and they'll give you a high five. This is the question. When you raise your hand to give the high five, that is the question. If you give yourself an answer, it's done. Now, if people give negative answers, you have an answer. There are two answers you're never allowed to give to this question. How can I, even though? Two questions you cannot do. And what those are, are any variations of, I don't know, or it just can't. As long as you don't give any two of those variations, you will find an answer. What most people say is, how do I get this job? I don't know. That's an answer, high five completed, walk on, go on about your day. How do we, get, how do we raise revenue even though we're losing money on a, on a monthly basis? How do we do it? We just can't. You have an answer. Be careful of how you choose to answer this question. 
It's amazing what can happen. We can solve big problems with it. I have the opportunity to travel around the country. I speak to high school students, middle school students, college students. I also work with organizations and associations about the idea basically of likability. On the organization and corporation level, it's how to create more likable salespeople, how to create a more likable work environment, bless you, and all those other cool things. With the students that I get to work with, which I love doing, I get them to like school, to see why education is important. Now, if you ask most students, do you like school, the answer will be no. It's boring, and I hate it. So I started asking myself, how do I get students to get excited about school? How do I get students to be excited about school? So I asked them a question when I go speak to them. I say, how many of you would love the idea of freaking your teachers out and making their brains explode? Without question, all it, oh my god, that way, if I could do it every day, let's do it every day. So I say, here's what you do. Have any of you ever gotten a book report or a paper that you've had to write or a science project? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, all right, doesn't the teacher give you like a deadline like they say it's done on, you know, if I give it you today, it's due on May 20th, right? I said, how many of you have ever done the entire project on May 19th and handed it on May 20th? I was like, yeah, we've all done all-nighters before. So I said, here's what you do. Look at your calendar and go a week earlier. Circle that as your deadline. So now you show up to class and you hand in your book report a week early. Your teacher goes, no, this book report is supposed to be handed in next week. You go, I know, I just finished it early. <laughs> like the teacher can't process that because it doesn't happen so often. So we come up with all these cool ways that they can have fun in school. We have students, I, I get emails and tweets and Facebook messages from students across the country saying stuff like, we showed up in class today and we erased the teacher's whiteboard because they usually erase it for themselves. The teacher was freaked out, it was awesome. I'm like, that's great. This is what they're getting excited about, doing the stuff that we try to beat into their heads. I got this one tweet from a student, which I love. I told her about the importance of appreciation, that teachers are extremely hard worked, very underpaid, and very underappreciated. I said, do stuff to make them feel appreciated. So uh, this is the young lady from Minnesota where I spoke, and she created this board for her teacher. I'm going to read it to you because I thought it was actually brilliant. She said, dear Mr. Miller, it has been a j Now, these are all candy, so you're going to get the references. It has been a joy to be in your class. You <laughs> deserve a payday, okay? You're such a sweet tart. You make me snicker all the time. Sometimes I'm an airhead or act like I'm from the Milky Way, but I truly am a nerd and I have extra fun, love you to pieces, your favorite student. They came in the class, they gave that to the teacher. The teacher was like all, you know, verklempt and emotional and stuff. It's possible to get kids excited about learning if we ask the right questions. It is possible. We have to focus on how can I, even though, how can I, desired outcome, even though, current challenge. The next time you find yourself in a situation and it seems like it's impossible. It seems like it's a big challenge. It seems like it's a big problem. And by the way, I'll just say this is a little bonus. I've been using the word problem throughout the presentation. I don't use the word problem in my normal conversation. I use it in a, in a, in a public setting because it's easily understood. I like to use the word challenge. A problem has a negative connotation to it. A problem is something's bad, something's wrong. A challenge can be overcame. A challenge can be worked through. So just try it. I'm a big believer in W. Clement Stone's quote, little hinges swing big doors. Look at problems as challenges and see how your challenges become a lot easier to deal with. Again, how can I desired outcome even though current challenge? So I want to apply this right now. I want to do something. I was sitting here thinking it's an honor to be part of the TEDx community. So I want to ask myself, how can I do something at a TEDx event that's never been done before even though there's a ton of amazing TEDx events already? So I did a little research, and I came up with something that I think has never been done at a TEDx event. Would you all like to be part of history with me? Sure. I need everyone to please do me a favor and stand on up, please. Okay. All right. We're going to do something that's never been done before. Anyone who's been to one of my presentations, you know what's about to go down. On the count of three, if you would, please turn to the person next to you, say you're awesome, and give them a high five. On the count of three, let's give it a shot. One, two, three, go! Give some love. Notice that we just connected the full circle. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being here. Boom! All right. Yeah. We are all awesome. That is a great <laughs> message. Does anybody have any questions for Arel Moody? You could take two questions. Ask yourself the question, how can I ask the question right now even though I'm nervous to speak in front of people? You have the answer. 
He's right here. He's one. There's a person right in the back. So, so my question is uh, about our education system. You know, one of the things that keep coming up is that students are becoming less and less engaged. The dropout rate is high, and teachers are under a lot of stress to do more with less resources. So, how can we rethink our educational system so that we are better engaging students and also showing more appreciation for teachers? Yeah, great question, great question. Um, it is a huge challenge. I, I see it every single day and it's heartbreaking. And I think that we put a lot of emphasis on um, students. And I think that's important. I think um, when we forget about the teachers, we get into a lot of trouble as well. Um, someone gave me a great quote about marriage and children that I think are applicable to teachers and students. They said that if you want to have, if you want to raise, someone told me if you want to raise a good, a good child, have a good marriage. There's actually a book by John Medina called Brain Wolves for Babies, and in the book he states that the best way to get your, your child to be well-adjusted and well-educated is to have a good parental relationship. Now, whether the parents are actually together, hopefully they do stay together. If they don't, they still have to be amicable because that is what's called the overflowing of the cup and passing that through to the students, um, to the children. So in the case with teachers, I'm a big advocate of putting an emphasis on how do teachers have a better environment. And I think a lot of the times, if anyone's ever been in any type of organizational structure, when things aren't going well below us, we look for ways to have strength by having conflict with those across from us. So teachers hating teachers, people, bless you, people you know, eating food out of the uh, fridge and not replacing it and not washing dishes and expecting someone else. Those little things cause stress. So if they can look forward to being there at school and having, you know, it could be simple things that the principal puts together on how that the teachers can work well together or be happy, whether it's uh, you know, taking them bowling or doing a Friday. Those little things go a very, very long way. And in addition to that, I would ask all teachers to ask themselves a question. How can I have a better experience in my classroom, even though things like Common Core have been changing and making things feel difficult inside of us? How do I do it? How can I be more fun? How can I make learning more experiential? And I think that if we focus on that and figure out how do we still do it to the book and still make sure we're hitting the goals, we take care of the teachers, and they can think creatively in the classroom, and a lot can happen. Most importantly, I would ask teachers, come up with ideas because you're smarter than I am. You're you know, well-educated people. If you focus on using this question, I think they'll come up with better solutions than I ever could. But thank you for that question. It's a great question. Let's have one more question. Right over here. Oh, it's a few, maybe? Where are we going? Who are we pointing oh, at? I'm just we'll pointing. Have, we'll have I'm two. Just Who wants to go first? Let's have over here first and then second, right over here. Hi. What's um, going on? <laughs> I read your, your um, biography in our pamphlet, and um, the way you were raised is very similar, but very different than I was raised. And I'm wondering how you overcame that. That's a great question. Um, for those of you who don't know who she's referring to, I grew up in the um, projects on welfare in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it was a tough environment, um, not easy. And everyone has a difficult environment at some way, I think. Just because I grew up in the projects and I've witnessed people being you know, shot, killed, stabbed, I've been robbed. You may not have physically gone through those things, but you've probably had a similar shared experience about emotional challenges, feeling like you don't fit in, feeling like you want more of yourself, but maybe your environment is telling you that you can't be better. These things are things we always constantly focus on. And what I think is a very important ideal is one, going back to this question, how can I even though? How can I become someone that's successful even though everything in my environment is telling me that I can't? One of the things that I think was most powerful in my upbringing that changed my life more than people who grew up literally in the same building, same school, same situation as me, but we ended up in two very different paths, is that I was very actively involved with after-school programs when I was a kid. Um, my mom made sure that I wasn't in the streets, that I was doing things like after-school programs, summer camps, and I saw things that I never saw before. That's what's so valuable to, I think, young people, to anyone who's in a challenge. If you feel like there's no way I can ever get out of the hood because that's all you see, you have to be able to be in a position to be taken to see a beautiful neighborhood. One day my father actually took me to a beautiful neighborhood in Brooklyn, beautiful house, beautiful cars, and I never saw anything like that before. And he said, one day, son, if you work hard enough, you can have things just like that. And it gave me the possibility and belief that it was possible. Now, do material things make the only reason to help someone? No, but for me, where I came from, that's what I needed to hear. 
So if we're exposed to ideas and we believe that it can be possible if we don't quit, amazing things can happen. And I think more we can get people engaged in positive activities, after school programs and things like that, visiting colleges and elementary school and junior high knowing that it's not a big scary place, it becomes more real and it becomes more tangible. And the more tangible something becomes, the more easy it is for you to say, I got this. So I would recommend that if I could. Great question. Last question over here. Good questions, I like this, thank you. Um, so given that the job market is currently in a very tight situation, yeah, uh, and students, even though they go to college, they still can't get, get jobs when they're out and they're mm -hmm. loaded with student debt, Definitely. how do we you know, stop people from being discouraged from continuing education or going to college? Because uh, you know, there's always the startup innovators, the big people who make it big without schooling, mm -hmm. but there's the people who can't do that. How do we ensure that people continue to want to go to school? It's great. Uh, it's a great question. Um, getting people excited about continuing education is very uh, near and dear to me. There's a few things that I love. Number one, there are not many of you that your retirement plan is hitting the lottery, right? In addition to that, I've heard of stories of individuals who've had amnesia and have had a blunt blow to the head and they regained all their memory. I've never seen a doctor going out and prescribing baseball bats to the head, right? So the reason why I share that with you is I love the fact that Mark Zuckerberg exists. It gives hope to so many people. He's the, literally a one in eight billion person. His story is so uncommon, but it gets talked about so much. The people that are in this room right now don't get as much TV press because it's not as sexy as a Mark Zuckerberg. So because of that, people are shooting for an ideal that honestly is not realistic for most people. The same way saying, you know what my, my goal is? I'm gonna win the lottery three weeks in a row. Like, is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? No, it probably won't happen. In addition to that, I think the way that students go about education is completely flawed. Um, if you, th anyone who thinks you go to school and you do what you're supposed to do in a classroom and you get your degree and you get a job, you're not gonna get one or a good one. I've noticed it. it's the biggest problem that I see with college students that I speak to across the country. Instead, what I found the most important, valuable thing about college is yes, everything you do in the classroom, but who do you meet outside of the classroom? Do you, are you actively involved on campus? Because what I found is the best jobs are never advertised. You're not gonna find them on Monster, you're not gonna find them on Craigslist, right? There's great jobs on those sites, of course, but not the really good ones. You know where they come from? They come from the professor who has a friend, and that friend goes to the professor and says, I really need to hire someone who does X. Do you know of someone? And they're going to go to those students who have shown the effort over an extended period of time. If you only put in the effort in the last week of school, you're gonna be in a really bad place. But if you show that you have leadership skills, you're actively involved, you start a project, you lead things, it's amazing how all of the student leaders on campus typically find themselves in really good places. You have to build relationships with people. You have to be in a place where you can learn by connecting with people. Because I believe it's not about what you know and it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you and who likes you. And the way that you get people to like you is to have a consistent track record of being a good human being. And I would also, again, tell people, ask yourself, how can I, even though? Focus on that question, and you'll probably come up with a better solution than I could. Oh, that's excellent. Let's have another round of applause. Fantastic.